Okay, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Jos van den Entregen, and uh, I'm today going to provide an overview about statistical parametric mapping. Um, I need to immediately mention that uh, I'm on the bottom of the list of names here, um, because there's really three people that are working very hard to try and mostly promote the use of statistical parametric mapping as a new statistical technique in the context of biomechanical data, but maybe it might also expand further to any biological observations that people make. And so hopefully you'll be able to be interested in that particular context. Um, so just to give an overview about what the plan is of today, uh, first of all I will address some principles, the very fundamental principles of statistical parametric mapping, and I will do that because I'm in a medicine environment here, I will do that by identifying what the typical symptoms are uh, in this type of research, uh, what the pathogenesis is, or rather what is really the cause of the problems, and then finally uh, what could be a suitable treatment for our problems that we have, uh, that we are facing in this particular context. Then obviously I cannot just let you go like that and I will have to make sure I provide some particular examples, and you already will see here that we have a t-test example, an ANOVA example, and a regression example. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with um, statistical parametric mapping, or SPM as we say, you might think, yeah, but this is basic statistics. Well, yes, the grounds of the technique is on the same principles as what we would use in our basic statistical hypothesis testing. Techniques. Finally, I will then also just touch briefly on how to eventually get going. Uh, how can people, if they do feel that this is maybe something that they can try out or that they want to use, how can they really try to get ready, get set, and then go with the technique? Okay? Good. So, first of all, what are the typical symptoms? So, I want you to now think of a measurement that you do, an observation that you do in your research, uh, which is something that you measure, for example, over time. And I'm not saying measuring over time in terms of on a daily basis or pre-post intervention, no, actually a measurement that has a time component to itself. In biomechanics we are very familiar with that. Yeah? So if we think about measurements of these kind of types, then we tend to get drowned in data that has a time component attached to it. And the time component, you can see a number of examples here. These are actually data that is a single observation, but it's not a single value that we get out, like you would have with a body mass value, that is a single value. Now we have an observation that exists of something with a time component in particular. And that is what we would call a dimensionality to the data. So rather than data without a dimension, zero dimensional data, we are talking here now in this case of potentially one dimensional data. So how do we typically go about with this type of data? Well, what we tend to do then, if we have that time component and we want to do hypothesis testing, say this is two groups of people, or this is two conditions that we want to compare, we have an average that we plot for both conditions, we have a standard deviation here, it's only one-sided standard deviation to make sure that it's visibly uh, kind of clear. Uh, but then what we tend to do is we either take an average or something out of that data, or in this case, for example, to keep the component of time inside our observation, we time normalize it, and then we do a t-test, for example, on each of these nodes, each of these time nodes, some people are laughing, I assume, um, and then we actually see when there is significant difference, and for example, during that time there, and during that time we have significant difference. But the big problem that we have with that is the particular issue of, well, if you do multiple tests, then you start to make a particular type of error in statistics. Yeah? Multiple testing, your alpha level is no longer valid. So this is where the problem has arisen in the past. Now, how do people mostly treat this data? Because this is a real big problem. Well, mostly what you tend to do is, I'm not going to worry about time, and I will reduce my data down towards something that becomes a single zero-dimensional variable. That single zero-dimensional variable could be a magnitude, for example in forces, a peak force, positive or negative, or a timing component. And then what we do is we put them in fantastically, visually, totally intuitive tables, yeah, which tell us exactly how the message is about the differences between conditions uh, here. I don't know if you sometimes are frustrated about that, but I know a lot of frustration when I read these kind of papers with endless tables of data. Yeah? 
then tell me what the real message is. And it doesn't really tell you what the message is, but it's what we can do, because this here allows us to calculate a mean value, a standard deviation value, and we can also do our statistical analysis on this, yeah? because we are very used to that. This is in 1D, but it applies also to something that is more complicated. Uh, you already saw the foot pressure data, for example. Well, this is 2D uh, or 3D. Well, sh let me show you an example of that, for example. So in 2D, this is foot pressures. We have actually a large number of sensors that are measuring the pressure under our foot. So we have lots of pixels, as you would say. But what we have to do is reduce that down. So what we tend to take is we take zones of pressures. So rather than looking at a pixel level, we actually will group them into a zone and average that zone. And so we look at the average values of those zones, and then we present it like this. Again, very intuitively, I would say not intuitively, uh, easy to interpret what the real context now is when I read this kind of uh, information. The same thing applies to 3D data, where I find this impossible to interpret. If someone has provided me with the zoning of bone, three-dimensional surface, for example, and then the zoning of those bones, you have to try to relate each number of the zone towards a statistical output that you see here, and then try and interpret that appropriately. It's very difficult to do that. So it's something that, first of all, is difficult to do, but also reduces down your data to something that maybe loses real information about your data. So that's what I would call the symptoms. Now, what is the pathogenesis? And you're all medically trained, so I would say, what is the real cause of these problems? Where does it really all start? Well, there's a couple of principles that I need to uh, talk to you about. And the first thing is the fact that biomechanical data, and I would like to expand that to biological, a lot of medical data, actually is spatio-temporally smooth. And what does that mean? The dimension that we have, for example, we have a dimension of time here in this case, in the 1D example, is actually smooth in a way that it has a certain smoothness that dictates how much adjacent time nodes are associated to each other. So if I have one particular observation at a certain time, then the observation immediately before that and the ob observation immediately after that are affected by that. They are dependent on that because I can't expect, based on the smoothness of my measurement, the spatial temporary smoothness of my measurement, I can't expect that to, to vary randomly. It will be close to that value because it's connected to it. That connection could be due to biological tissue viscoelasticity, for example. Yeah? Tissues that are next to each other, they are actually affecting each other. Yeah? But also time, when something changes, it's actually limited in how rapidly it can change from one value to another value. And we have to obviously take into account that we need to sample above the Neuquist frequency, but most people in biomechanics will know that if you want to observe a signal that has a certain rapid fluctuation, then you have to make sure you measure it at least twice the frequency of that fluctuation uh, speed. Yeah? So that's a simple um, explanation of that Neuquist frequency. Now, this applies to 2D and 3D as well, and so when you look at these measures in two dimensions or in three dimensions, then in the same way, we have that viscoelasticity there that applies. So, our observations have a level of smoothness. There is a dependency between time nodes, but also, in this case, a dependency between adjacent pixels in our observation. Yeah. And we need to take that into account. This is where people would have to do a Bonferroni correction or any post hoc correction when they multiple tests over the 101 data samples in a normalized time curve. Yeah? Now there is no ground to do that correction because it's based on something that is actually dependent on the smoothness of your signals. Now another thing that we can then use to identify that principle of dependency is then to express your smoothness from totally random data that has no connections between adjacent data points, which is on the left here. The FWHM that you see on the screen is a parameter that indicates smoothness. And so if that parameter is 0%, then actually the, the data can randomly fluctuate between 
measures. So how many measurements do we have there really? Well, we actually have 101 measurements that are independent there. Now, as we increase the smoothness value, so as we increase this value here, we actually make it more smooth, and you can see that the signals, first there on the top and then on the bottom, it, they become more and more smooth. And I'm going to go straight to the extreme. If it's infinitely smooth, then it means that all our data is connected to each other, strictly spoken. So that means there's a horizontal line. That actually means that I have reduced my temporal observation to a single observation. So in that case, I actually have a single observation. So I've gone from 101 observations to one single observation. And the question is, how does this evolve from one to the other? And this is where the smoothness can be used in statistical parametric mapping to identify that, to know what the level of dependency is between your time nodes or between your pixels in your data. And that is the foundation of random field theory that you apply in this context. Yeah. So this is where you have a field that you're observing which has a certain level of smoothness to which we can then apply our statistical tests. Another thing that is important in biomechanical data is that the data is bounded. The data is bounded in a way that we, we know where the kind of constraints of the data are. Now that is important because it means that we can compare observations functionally over that bounded constraint. And what I can use as an example, uh, which is easiest to begin with, for example, is this foot. We know that the foot has a certain shape. It has a number of bones in the foot. It has a number of constraints because of the joints in these bones that connect these bones together. And so what we have is we have a constraint of how a foot looks like. So what we can do is because we know that anatomy, we can actually put different foots in terms of the pressure that we measure on top of each other. Yeah? And so when we put those on top of each other, we can then compare between individuals. The same applies for temporal data. Very often we have key events, touchdown, takeoff. Yeah? But they can even be anything else but key functional events that mean that we can put the data of different conditions or different populations on top of each other with those events as our reference frame, which we call a bounding of our data, basically. Yeah? So we've bounded our data, which is a very useful thing, and that means, uh, in, in engineering terms, we can register our data against each other. Yeah? But this is an important thing, because if you violate that principle, then obviously you're also violating the principle of SPM in that case. So you need to judge, to an extent, to which extent your particular data can be registered appropriately. So if you have feet of different shapes, can I still put them on each other and compare for each pixel something that is functionally telling the same thing? If I have different gait uh, cycles or different types of gait, think about walking slow and walking fast, then this whole thing changes which probably functionally still allows you to compare different time nodes, or sorry, the same time nodes between the different conditions. But if you start to compare walking and running, it's a different thing, because then the running physical constraints have very different functional meanings, potentially, at the same time nodes that you would put those against each other. Yeah. And so that's a constraint or a limitation that you have, but in most cases, or in many cases, people are currently, and have, have a justification to treat them uh, in a bounded way.